You can't come to my community and tell me something I've known to be true all along, that it is backward, that it is barbaric. Communication is not about using jargons. It's about, it is simplifying the message, coming from a technical aspect and being able to decipher that information for every person to understand. Two thirds of communication is non-verbal. It's not what people say, it's what they're not saying through their non-verbal. We should avoid boardroom strategies. See how the community behaves, see the patterns, see the channels that they use. This is the NFGM podcast with Asenath Mwithika. Welcome to the End FGM podcast. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I spend time with change makers who are making an impact in Kenya and beyond. Each week, we listen to incredible stories of ordinary people just like you making a difference. They share their successes, failures, and what they are learning along the way. Thank you for being with me today. Let's get started. Today on the NFGM podcast, I join Asnath Mwitiga, who is a social communication expert, having worked with national and international organizations, as well as communities on the ground. And today she talks to me about how to better communicate the anti-FGM message. Why is it important to have you know, something like a communication department to somewhere or um, factor in communication streams to try to bring an end to female genital mutilation. We always say that communication is uh, passing information from one person to another using a channel. And of course, for there to be mutual understanding, there must be feedback. So in our daily interactions, we strive to communicate effectively. That is my thoughts translated into words pass across to people so they can be able to understand and there's no bias in that process and they're able to get my message clearly and also out of that I can get a reaction or a response which would be a feedback then we can say that that communication is complete and it has flowed because you're talking about communication for development which is very important and I've seen most organizations actually do not have a budget for communication let alone a budget they don't think that they need to have competent communication experts who can be able to guide uh, the processes in the programming and therefore there's a huge gap because like in Mandela I was doing communication and IT <laughs> right? And then now there's a program I needed to, to come and uh, support. And that is how we were able actually to do a lot because I was able to understand this is the issue and this is how we communicate through it to be able to find a solution. When we talk about a sensitive issue like FGM, which is a social norm, people have been socialized throughout their lives as they've been growing up to believe that it is something they have to do. They're expected to do it, and it is a rule that it is governing the way they behave. It and, and it's mostly untold among these communities. Someone expects to go through the cut. Yes, it is a normative expectation that uh, your, your people are expecting you to undergo FGM. And there's a question, of course, if I don't do it, what will people think of us? What will people think of my family? You know? So the social expectations around it and the family owner that is um, uh, surrounding FGM is really making it impossible that individual families are unable to abandon FGM. And therefore, when you're implementing an FGM program, you're uh, doing any work to support maybe grassroots organization or anyone, the direct affected people, when you're doing that, then you need to come from a very sensitive point. And it's only by understanding and being able to communicate that effectively to know what words to use that will not cause backlash. Because in uh, you can't come to my community and tell me something I've known to be true all along, that it is backward, that it is barbaric. You know, using such words, you're, you're causing 
a backlash into your campaign, into your strategy, and you won't go far. But you need to come with a very accommodative approach. And that is why we talk about the do no harm approach. That in anything, try first to understand the experiences of these people. Because they have done it for years, all right? So appreciate the years of experience that they have had and understand why they are doing it. Uh, this week I was doing a training for CS CSOs of NAROC in Ivasha, trying to explain to them how to communicate effectively to NFGM. And the question I asked them, do you know why the people who came before us have been practicing FGM? Or is this something that we have just picked up and we want to end? And are we all convinced that we need to end FGM? Because I remember when I was doing one uh, a training in the Gambia, one of the participants was like, Asana, I don't believe that we can end FGM. For me, I don't see the, the, what's wrong about it. I mean, our mothers, our grandmothers have done it. They've had ten, 10 children. They have not died. They have not had all this. So why do you want me to end FGM? In Kenya, we have 43 tribes, I believe. And out of the 43, it's only about four or five communities that do not practice FGM. The rest have in the past, and we can see a recurrence like in the Kikui communities, and others are still doing it. And as much as we are 21% preference, according to the Kenya Demographic Health Survey, we are still have communities that are 98% prevalence, 95, 85, and so on. And when we are doing the work on NFGM, the advocacy aspect, we don't speak to our communities in English or in Swahili. We, we need to change that tactic. We need to empower the few elite so that they can be able to go to their communities and use their local dialects and speak to the language that they understand. If you come to my community, Meru, when you come and say FGM, I'll just look at you if I'm from Mukomashinani. Because it has its name. It's, it has the way the community refers to it. So if we can change the tactic and communicate in the simplest forms, communication is not about using jargons. It's about it is simplifying the message, coming from a technical aspect, and being able to decipher that information for every person to understand. Even when you look at the television when people are speaking, I'm sure people know so much English, but they don't use the dictionary language. And especially when you look at politics, you see they have diluted the language to speak to the common man. And this is why FGM is happening at the grassroots. Machinani ukondani kabisa. Therefore, it is important that in as much as you have gotten maybe a, even like, for example, the law, you understand it first, and then you, you are able to pass that message. Communication is about transfer of message from one person to another. Now, I've read the law, and it's telling me one, two, three. Now, how I've understood it, how can I transfer to that local person who is, an, who is not an elite? You know, that person who is not, uh, has no high level of education, so they can be able to understand. When we say it is a human rights uh, violation, how do you understand human rights violation in your local language? And you're able to show them using examples that are specific, you know, the content. That's why we say when you're using social change communication, the content of your communication has to be locally led because. The community has to be the agent of the change. And for me to join you, to be able to advocate against FGM, I have to be with no doubt have understood what you're talking about. But you come from Nairobi, you're saying FGM, you're saying all these jargons, and you lost me. So you'll just speak, but you're not communicating. So. Let's thrive to, tr to understand the information and then transfer it in the simplest forms. Degrees don't work at the lower level. I've always said that. It does not matter when you have a PhD. Ukifika pale kwa kijiji, and that's why there's even the mood of dressing and all that. Please, can you be able to conform to the way they are? Ukipata wana oshangu, endo oshangu now, and hear how they speak, and don't go and throw NFGM. Find a way of creating rapport with these people because then you are about to introduce a subject that is very sensitive. And how can they trust you? Because 
it is about issues of trust, you know. They used to say when I was doing communication 101 <laughs> a long time ago, there's, a, there's a proximity and chance. Then there's, there was a stage of risk taking, you know, and then turn taking and something like that. There's the issue of trust. If I don't trust you, I will not share my information with you. And we need this information. And that is how, if you have the trust, you've gained the trust of the community, and you're humble, <laughs> very important, that uh, you, you really have to blend with the community so that they can be able to see you as one of them and embrace you. And then the information will flow. I say we struggle so much, yet communities have answers to how we end FGM. Over the years, many people have been working towards ending this uh, ending this vice in our communities and um, sometimes people don't even have a problem with with the issue itself but how people are addressing um, the campaign makes people much more adamant in trying to hold on to their practice. I've had so many community conversations in many communities in Kenya and outside and I've always strived to to fit in. I remember when I was in Hargeisa I was in a buibui and a, hij and a hijab. And they looked at me and they're like, wow. You had to buy that? Like, yes, I, I love your dressing, <laughs> you know. And uh, learning the manners, I call them manners, of the community. If women are not supposed to sit with the men, don't sit with the men if you're a woman. Two thirds of communication is nonverbal. And that is why I'm talking about dressing because it's part of communication. You're communicating something. So don't remove it from communication. The way you behave non-verbally is contributing to communication. It actually plays a bigger role than what actually you say. It's not what people say. It's what they're not saying through their non-verbal. So it is important. And uh, <laughs> that's why I said, before I say why speaking in the local dialect is important, is let's understand that is just a third of it. The two thirds is what you're not saying, but people are seeing. Are, are you there because it is a job you've gone to tick a box, or are you there genuinely that you really are involved in the process? Just touching to something that I find is very important in also acting as the locals do. For example, among the Maasai community, you women usually respectfully, in terms of the culture, greet um, elder people, either women who are fit to be their mothers or even their fathers, um, by bowing down and having their head touched. But um, we often go to communities and do not learn those simple things that you know help them embrace embrace us when we come in. So as we talk about the language, the non-verbals also, how important are they in trying to you know bring in and involve this community so that they can own this message? Uh, as you're speaking, I remember the. Uh, <laughs> going to those communities and some of the things that we had to do because then it, it's their way of doing thing, things, you know, and, and you have to respect that is how if you're given, a, if you're seated round in a circle and everyone is drinking from that bowl, you have to do that. It does not care that Nairobi in you or anything you get. So the disconnect there that I find is that people don't research. You just want to wake up and go and implement a program. And you say, I work in four counties. But in these four counties, how well do you know them? Do you have even people from those counties that are your resource persons that tell you, don't come applying Qtex here, high heels, you know? <laughs> you, you need to research about a community thoroughly. You have to submerge yourself and be in that community. All right, so that when you go there, it's only the name that is different. And sometimes when you tell them the name and they can't pronounce like my name as enough, they will give you a local name. I, I, I can't even begin to tell you the number of names I have across <laughs> Kenya and <laughs> out because they, they embrace you as their own. And that is the most beautiful thing. I always say one of the lessons I've learned when I've been doing this work is how genuine communities are. 
they embrace you as who you are. And if they don't like something, they will tell you. They don't know how to... to they're not hypocrites. They're not political. And they're not political. Now, so if you do your research, then you'll get your two-thirds of nonverbal correct because you will know how to speak when you're supposed to speak because you don't want to... You don't want to evoke some mixed reactions. I will tell you a story. I went to Baringo in 2014 or 2013, uh, Tugen community. And um, so uh, the facilitator was from the community because I couldn't speak the language. So I empowered the facilitator and then the facilitator conducted the the community conversation. And then after he spoke for an hour, they're just nodding, nodding. And then when he got, when he was done, he asked if there was any question. And then no one responded. So in as much as I was warned, <laughs> I decided to wake up and just uh, stand up and just speak. There were elders, there were men, there were women, and uh, yeah, Morans. So I asked them, did you understand everything? They said, yes. So I asked a question. So why are you still practicing FGM? One man raised his hand and was like, fine, I've gotten my answer. So I was like, yes, speak. Then he said a proverb in his local language. And then I was like, what did he say? So everyone laughed, not knowing that. And then he was like, mama, umekeketwa? Like Kusha Mimi. <laughs> I could not answer because then that would bring in conflict. So what does umekeketo mean? Are you mutilated? So I did not respond because I knew it would bring in conflict. Here I am. Uh, I may not be a survivor, but it does not have to be a survivor. You don't have to be a survivor for you to work on NFGM. But for them, they don't see it that way. And I'm standing in a community where they believe that Mimi in I'm a child, you know, me meaning I'm total because I've not undergone the practice. Now, then he said, you just go and sit down there. Then just let us write for you all the answers to the questions that you have, and we are going to give it to you. But please, don't ask these questions when we are all of us. That also happened to me somewhere in Samburu where we had mixed the men and uh, women. Very innocently, we were almost, because we had printed, you know, like the, the, the types of FGM mm -hmm. I, on big charts, and we wanted to show them. Then an old man um, just woke up and came and whispered and said, please don't open that thing because we have in-laws here. And that really taught me a lot in terms of how do you communicate effectively because we've also had instances where when people go to the grassroots they want to say no no we have to communicate it this way hardly you know and uh, sometimes that is not sustainable because once you try to push it straight to the people without considering how they'll take the message we just leave that place um, and everything con continues so i agree with you We've not really delved into the importance of indigenous languages um, and empowering, as you said, locals in ending this vice. Mm. Yeah, so, <laughs> so moving on, I actually uh, achieved my goal for the day because I wanted them to speak. And I knew if had I put them separately, they would not have felt you know, the urge to speak. But of course, I learned my lessons. <laughs> it's a learning lesson every day you learn something. Yeah, and uh, we were able to understand some of the reasons as to why the community was practicing. Now, I said the facilitator was speaking in their local dialect. You don't have to be the one, the face all the time. Empower people who can represent you, opinion leaders, people who have earned that respect and they command that attention in those communities. And then something you've said before I continue with the dialect is using scare tactics. You've scared me today, so I mean, <laughs> you're done, so what are you going to do tomorrow, you know? But you're scaring me, that does not mean I will conform to your, your thoughts, you know? But if we dialogue about it and you show me in a way that you explain it in a way for me I can understand, then it makes me understand 
without being scared that ah so this is an older way of doing things and some of these things with time they change and gradually we are moving you understand before people were not wearing clothes they were wearing skin where are we now so empowering um a facilitator who can speak in a local dialect remember the way we think if we speak, you speak to me today i will translate it fast in my mother tongue and then now speak maybe english or swahili or any other language that i can speak because that is how i'm fluent that is how i know how to think it's easier for me i understand issues in my local language so it is important because that way you're able fast to understand your culture well the beliefs the pattern the behaviors so if you're speaking to me in a local dialect i'm able to understand it in black and white it's not sugar coated but if you come to me and speak to me in english and swahili i'm like what is this person saying do they even know our culture number two, it it shows that uh it it is um you're creating a rapport with these people and they see you as one of them because <laughs> I'll give you an example. There's another community I went to and uh, all the men agreed that they were older men. They behaved as if they didn't know Swahili. So I said, "I'm Jambo, how are you?" And they did not respond. And then someone told me they don't hear Swahili. <laughs> But they're trying to see what is it that you're selling? What is it that you're telling them? So when the facilitator spoke to them in their local language, like, "Ah, so you're one of us." So you know now they open up but when you when when they are faced with this foreign for them it's foreign swahili and english is foreign <laughs> then they are like you're not one of us so why should you t- why should we tell you our secrets of our community you know our culture and the way we guard our cultures it is very special it's very intimate so the the importance of local dialects and this is to everybody if you're working across countries or a country that has many local dialects find or empower people who understand this dialect because then they are going to have endless conversations and you're going to understand deeply the questions the answers to your question the community sometimes does not want to have a conversation about fgm in itself but there are things that they really want and they know that fgm is a hindrance have you experienced that before and um, is it important to know what the community really values yes i've experienced that and yes it's important to know what community values what is fgm fgm is not the cut fgm is a process and if you're working on end fgm i will tell you one thing know that it does not start the day a woman or a girl is mutilated or is cut it is a process that begins from the day a girl is born they know when it gets to a certain age we are going to start preparing like this like this we we'll need to involve people yesterday the people of narok were telling me they used to use milk honey uh s- some leaves and what so it it's not the cut that is fgm it is a process it it is it is a ceremony the cut is just a stage in that process if you go to talk about fgm for them it's a non issue because ah they will start saying you know sasa this is the season off you know maybe they have looked at the clouds or up and they are seeing i don't know what and they say oh this is the season where we are start, supposed to start uh, preparing things maybe it's the harvest season and that's how they look at it they don't look at it as fgm they look at it as if this is maybe the harvest season or this is the planting season along the way there will be fgm so it's it's not a stand alone it is a stage in their processes so if you don't understand that and you go and tell them let's end fgm they'll be like <laughs> so do we end our process what is it that you're telling us to end this is the issue of um what the community values and that is why for the longest time people say it people from kajiado are mutilating their girls and taking them to be married off so there's girl child drop out of school what are we seeing now the girl is mutilated stays back in school 
I've had enough cases of the girls who have, during the holiday, they go, they visit their grandmother, or you hear, oh, I don't know, they went where, they're mutilated. When they open school, they're back in school. So is that what community values? What, why does communities continue to, why do communities continue to practice FGM? For me, that is the question I ask every morning when I wake up. Because I believe we will devise all the strategies. But we don't know why. How, the, how did it start? We've had people say it started as a pharaonic or pharaonic way. Others say it was, like yesterday I was told, when the warriors used to go hunting, they would uh, have their women mutilated so that when they come back, the women are not pregnant by the boys, you know, which was also a taboo. But do they still go hunting? You understand? So why are communities holding on to FGM so much that they don't want to let go? What is the significance of it? There was a conversation we had about the origin of FGM in my community, and we really could not address it, but people said, you know, it's important for transition from girlhood to womanhood. But most of the people I've actually talked to really do not have a um, concrete reason why they do that. And that's a challenge because it also involves curses, it involves, um, you know, important things that people hold on to in the community, and it involves religion to some, um, some of them attach it to their dignity. And so while communicating these messages and trying to, to involve the community to be the drivers of change, what strategies do you use to, you know, help drive it as a social scientist, I'd say? <laughs> what strategies do you use um, in your office without going to the field? What do you have to think about um, on how to engage these communities better? When you look at the various strategies that have been used in the past, there are so many, okay? But we're still having FGM as a global issue. We're still having 200 million women and girls who have undergone, globally, undergone FGM. We are risking, like, now it's like 4 million women and girls who are at risk every year. So what is it that we're doing wrong? I don't think there's one specific strategy. That's what, that's what I'll be honest with you. And I'll tell you why. When I was doing the training in Narok for the Narok CSOs yesterday, Narok is one community. But one of the participants explained something that made me understand and actually that affirmed why I'm saying we cannot have just one strategy. In as much as Narok is one county performing FGM, they are clans. And all these clans practice, their way of performing FGM is different. And the expectations for the girls who are being performed FGM too, and the, the, the ones who are performing, it, it is a different, it is dynamic, you understand? So if you said we are going to Narok and we are using this one approach or this strategy, it will not work. We have statistics, you said 200 million girls in, in the world. But community-based statistics is also one issue that is really um, a challenge, especially in addressing issues generally in terms of development in our communities. As we speak about cutting girls in our communities, do we have statistics that guide us within the communities and approaches that, that are community-led that also address specific niches of people even within like the Maasai community we say this this is the percentage of people who are still practicing uh, this vice do we have strategies on reaching this this specific niches in in these communities issue of data is a challenge across boards we may not have specific data for communities each community and it's not just community when you go the lower level into the clan, the clans, because now, fine, you might have Narok is this percentage, but then you're seeing that there are clans that are practicing it differently. So we may not have up to that lower level. So still up to date, data is a challenge, all right? Uh, they have said, uh, or over time, people have been saying then, let's use alternative rites of passage, okay? I don't want to comment much about it, because I have my reservations. And uh, I'm having this, I know Mindelo was the organization that started Alternative Rites of Passage. 
um, at what point it's working, at what point it's not working, that is another conversation because we have seen challenges out of it. But I believe community dialogue, for me, I've seen it working because we are in our Afri in our African ways we are we are communal people okay and that is how maybe I believe in the Nyumbakumi came out as a result we we are we are people we are people we are people's person or person you know what I mean so there's no point that you will find women are alone you I mean you won't find women are, you'll find women doing a merry-go-round you will find children playing in a field somewhere you will find men playing a jua or whatever their leisure, you know, sport or game. There's a time you will find different audiences, you know, different groups of people seated and passing time and doing their own things. And if we have people who understand how to introduce some of these social issues and have these different pockets picked about it, then we are able to move forward. So the strategy I would, as, as Asenat, I would suggest for people is to use community dialogues. When you go to churches on a Sunday, there's so much people there, there's a congregation. When you go to, on Friday to a mosque, you will find people there. So if we can be able to take advantage, because we are talking about having a critical mass of people who can be able to abandon the practice. We, because if the risk there is is if individuals, few people are abandoning the practice, they risk backlash. They risk the sanctions from the community because it is a social norm. But if you have a critical mass of people who become a network that will grow to become a movement, then they will end FGM. But they have to start the dialogues, the conversations, at a family, at a community level, at a peer level. If we are talking about it every day, wherever space we find, then we are moving forward. The other thing I want to say, we should avoid boardroom strategies, right? Where you sit in a boardroom and you think, let's use this strategy. Do your research. See how the community behaves. See the patterns, see the channels that they use. Is it that on a Sunday afternoon, people are out for, you know, a, a rally or they're doing a sport? If you do that research, then it will, it will inform the strategy to use. And that way then, you work with the community to devise the strategy. The strategy should not come from Nairobi to the community. It should come from the community themselves so they can be able to embrace it so that even the content they're using is theirs. Because there are words you will take to a community and they'll be like, we don't say it that way. We don't speak that way. This is not how, this is not our way. And therefore already that is a no. But if they have done it themselves, you know, maybe they are doing bids, bid work, and they're like, fine. Our strategy will be, maybe every Saturday when the women are sitting and they're doing bid work, we'll be saying, you know, or we'll be discussing that girl who went to be mutilated and you know what happened it does not have to come from a positive even the negative can be a catalyst to uh, spark the debate and the discussion around it when you sit down these communities you realize that by the end of the day they are not doing these practices to harm their children when they are addressing these issues the communities will sit down and say this is a ceremony that marks the passage of these girls from this age set to this age set. What advice would you give to particularly community-based organizations in regards to delegating issues to local people um, so that they can be also be catalysts of change in their communities? It's, it's important that you mentioned when uh, communities practice FGM, for them it's not harm. According to a UNICEF report, the Innocent Report, it states clearly that where the communities practice FGM, for them it's not a dangerous act. It is one of the necessary steps to raise their girls to meet or fulfill the societal expectation. So that has to be at the back of our minds every time we are interacting with communities to know 
They don't see this as harm. They don't see this as dangerous. So don't go telling them it is dangerous and it is harm because you, you will never, you know, they will never see it from your perspective. You understand? So the role of community change agents is very important. For me, I tell people, when you have those meetings, even if, even if it's a circumcised, have them on board. Find out why they're doing FGM. Have the reformed circumciser. What changed their mind? That is a very strong change agent who can be able to influence other uh, circumcisers or cutters to be able to stop it. Because they are now opinion shapers. Because if I was a circumciser before, for example, and then I've stopped, if I'm going to address my former, or my, yeah, my former circumstances, I will tell them, these are the reasons. This is what I did. This is what I believed. This is, the, I changed now, and these are the reasons. And you're able to get it from a first-hand person who understands it. So let empower communities to be able to do this work. Let it not be experts doing this work. Because experts are from away from the community, they're outsiders, they're not community, they're not from the community. But if I have an old mze, an old man, who is respected in the community, who is known that maybe his daughters have never undergone FGM, and they're doing so well, he will be able to talk to people and tell them, you know what, these are my reasons, this is why I did this, and see. You know, they are able to give a first-hand information, and from there, it is easily embraced as opposed. And they understand the Mila na tamaduni, the traditions of the community. That's what I mean, yeah. And, and therefore, they are seen not as outsiders, but um, people from the community and is buying and. And of course, they are, they are able to to use maybe proverbs or you know, th there's a way that communities speak. And they can say even one word, and it's done. As opposed to, if you're not from that community, and you'll be like, how do I? I'm able to convince people. There's, we call it uh, social linguistics, the, the use of language to influence uh, societal patterns. Yeah. We bring this to a close. Um, and I'd like you to leave with two things. Um, First is a piece of advice to anyone who's uh, someone who would like to delve into the campaign against uh, female genital mutilation in the long run. What advice would you give to such people who are working within the communities and even outside the community in trying to address these issues in terms of communication? Okay, uh, that, that's a multi-sector approach. <laughs> <laughs> we start at policy level, we start maybe with the government and uh, of course them is uh, an enforcement of maybe the laws and that. We have the Prohibition of Female Genital Mutilation Act of 2011 in Kenya. And uh, you go to communities and they have no idea what you're talking about. There are recommendations that uh, maybe it's supposed to be translated into the local dialects so that people can be able to to understand it, but my thinking is, what of the people cannot read, you know, or write, so where do we leave them? So when, when we do policy, the implementation aspect, what is your communication like? How is it that maybe you can use a pictorial, you can use an infographic that would be able, something, you can use maybe drama, art, what is it that you, how can you translate the content from the jargon to the easily understood? You'll have communicated, you understand? That's what I would advise at the policy level. Well, at the policy level, you have to use the policy language, but look at the implementation of this policy and how people can be able to um, transfer this information from the technical to the local. And then that way, you're going to have gotten your message home. Because I'll tell you, in many, many counties or in many um, communities in, across this country, they know there's a law, and they are running away from the law. And they don't know why they are running away from the law, apart from what Afungwa. They're going to be jailed. So, and uh, I don't believe that's all it says in that law. There are many things it says in the law. So the implementation should be 
the strategy should be a, there must be a communication strategy that helps to translate the technical to the local. Now, for the donor, understand what you're funding, because I've seen many cases whereby it is a beautiful proposal on paper, but cannot be implemented because the information on paper is not doable on the ground. And therefore, it, it's a challenge. So, if you're writing a proposal today to present to a donor, because I believe uh, you're the people to advise your funder to fund because you've seen a need, do extensive research and work with the communities. Let it come from them. Let it not come from Nairobi. Because you've seen uh, this uh, Sustainable Development Goal 5.3, you need to end all harmful traditional practices, including FGM and child marriage, and you want to write a proposal to that effect. Work with the community, understand the needs, and then write a proposal that can be implemented. And advise the donor that it will take time we are not about ticking boxes. We are not about numbers. This is a social norm change. So don't ask me how many people, how many, what number. It's not about number. It's about change of attitudes, change of behavior. And it takes time. It's not a one-off. And it is not, I cannot come and say today, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, you've changed. And looking at you, you've changed your attitude, you know. So. It is out of the way your reaction, the way you behave after a period of time. Maybe you had girls who are about to be mutilated and they never pass through that and they can see for sure. Out of the things that we've been doing, I can see a change. Change takes time. So don't be quick to ask, so what are the numbers that will not work with ending FGM? That needs to be clear. Activists, please research and move away from <laughs> so, <laughs> i'm laughing because i almost said something yes but let us work together i believe in coordinated collaborated approaches our vision we are working towards end fgm in whatever sector you are you're in the media you are at the grassroots it's not a competition there are scarce resources. If we come together, we can end it. And it is for everybody as well, the policy, the CBOs, the donor. If, if we can actually even have a pool whereby you're putting a pool of NFGM, for example, in Kenya, in all these countries, and let every organization, every person working on NFGM tap into that, then it, it would really work out. Have a, a resource uh, persons who can be able to advise. There are many people who have been ending FGM for the longest time. I always say this, when I joined Mandela and I told you, I was as green as they come, I didn't know much. But I tapped into a resource. One of my friends from FIDA, Alice Maranga, if I can mention her. She's the one who held my hand and walked with me. I used to ask her even the, the silliest of the questions because I was eager to learn and I needed to learn. Don't wake up one morning and you want to end FGM and you say you know everything. It takes time. I've done so many mistakes also along the way, and I correct them because it is a learning lesson. But let's work together. Let's stop competition. If you're working as a partner, donor, if you're working as an NGO and a CBO, let's work together. Don't say, Narok Nyangu, nobody should come there. No, 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 no. The common vision here is NFGM. So if I'm coming in with my expertise, someone is coming in with their money, let's work together. And that is the only way then we can be able to end FGM. For the CBOs, know the community. Give us the data. I believe all the CBOs in this country, if they are collecting the data, we may not even have to rely after five years or four years for the KHA, Kenya Demographic Health Survey or the multiple indicator uh, cluster survey to come out after five or four years. You know, We will be having first-hand information feeding to ACAF you know, the Africa Coordinating Center of Abandonment of FGM. And that way we can build synergy. You can also be a feeding to anti-FGM board, you know, so that we can work together. 
you can also be supporting the Office of Director of Public Prosecution. When there are all these cases that their girls were being mutilated and there's no one to take to court, what happened? You know? So if we work together, we can end FGM in Kenya. If a listener of this podcast wants to reach out to you, how would they do that? My email address, maybe, is amwithiga at gmail.com. Uh, you'll find me on social media, Facebook, Asanath Mithiga, Twitter, Asanath Mithiga, handle A Mithiga, or LinkedIn, Asanath Mithiga. Mithiga has a H. Yes, there's a H at the end, yes. All right, that's Asanath Mithiga, a social communication strategist who has worked with communities in Kenya and beyond and has advised us on many things. But among the things that I take home today is the importance of letting the communities lead, just empower them with communication and let them lead, take, let them take the lead in um, speaking to their communities because they understand their cultures, they understand how to approach different audiences and who should actually do it from the grassroots level. And again, one thing I always say is you'll never be at the community all the time. So if you empower someone who will be there at all time and is convicted and has uh, the belief that, you know, this should end in the community, then there's someone who's going to push the agenda still at the community level. This is the NFGM podcast. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. You've been listening to Asenad Mwidiga, who brings us close to this week's NFGM podcast. Asante Sana for coming uh, to meet me and having a sit down with me. I really appreciate it. And to the listener, Asante Sana, thank you very much for taking your time to listen to this podcast. I hope that you have learned. Until next Monday, take care. You can get bonus materials, notes, and much more at www.kipainoi.com. K-I-P-A-I-N-O-I.com. Please remember... We all can do something. Go out and make a difference. For we all have a responsibility to make this world a better place. Goodbye.